Welcome to the podcast. Today we've got Max Eisner, CPA, with us. We're bringing in an accountant to talk money, finance, the world around us today. How you doing, Max? Pretty good, Justin. How about yourself? Doing quite well. Stuck at home, but what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, that seems to be everybody nowadays. Yeah. I wanted to, one of the biggest things I want to talk to you about was funding available. A lot of people are sadly losing their jobs, getting laid off, all that. What do you got for me? Well, the first thing I want to say is, I mean, every day I hear updates, every day Trudeau is on the news talking about, hey, this is what I want to do. Here's my plans. This is how I'm going to do it, which is all fine and well. But until anything get passes through Parliament, it's not in effect and people can't access it, which is why for the like people trying to access wages and subsidies for when they get laid off, it's not available, even though they said, hey, yesterday I heard there's going to be something available for $1,200 a month or $2,000 a month or $5,000 a month, all of which I've heard from other people. Um, the first thing available that I think has actually been passed through is the $2,000 a month um, employee reimbursement plan. So this will be, it's actually a weekly $500 flat fee for people who got laid off, but at the same time can't access EI. So that's going to be a lot smaller group than I think people think they're going to be able to get it. Because most well, people, if you get laid off, are going to be able to access the EI. Yeah, and there's a big part of it too. Like um, I've been dealing with people who are who've had like a diminished income, but they still have some income. So they're right now not actually able to get that funding, like you're saying. And I think the you know, we're in a tough situation, a tough world where they're trying to react quickly, which isn't exactly, I would say, the government's specialty. Um, and there's a lot of people being currently left out because I think that as we film this, the CERB went live this yeah. week for applications, I think. Yeah. So that's like the first thing, right? The CERB, which is good. It's a good program. And at least you can get some funding if you're eligible. But again, I think most people are going to be pushed towards EI as opposed to this program, which overall EI will probably be less beneficial depending on your wage. And that's a big part too, is it is dependent on how much you were earning. And, um, you know, there's some other things as well that they're putting in. Like um, I saw the rent, you're able to push off rent in certain, certain provinces and things like that. So, I mean, they're working on it. But like you said, there's a, there's a lot of things, a lot of people, too, who are going to need help and do need help. Right. And then even the rent, I think that got pushed onto the landlords. Yeah, they can not they are not allowed to request rent. But if they still are requesting rent, it's who's following up with that, who is making sure that the people, the renters are being like accounted for and making sure that like their rights are being protected. Because I've heard numerous occasions where renters are still being asked for rent and they're saying, well, I can't do this. And then the landlord is kind of, Hey, what do I do? If I'm not getting rent from you, how am I now going to afford what I owe? How am I going to afford my mortgage payment? It's and then, a crazy thought process and a crazy process in general. Like if someone doesn't have income, they can't pay rent. If they can't pay rent, the mortgage can't get paid. That means the bank doesn't have the money that they're supposed to have. And now the Canadian government doesn't have the investments that it has. So it's kind of a, a straight line right now. And we need that revolving circle that we don't have. Right. Yeah. It's just flow, a flow down the chain, right? Like the first person isn't getting income. It's just going to flow all the way through down to the economy. So it looks like they're trying to stimulate the economy, trying to help people out one section or one group type at a time. It's just right now, everything's still on a standstill because they're pushing through what they can, but even the programs themselves are up for debate and what is actually the best kind of course of action is still up for debate. So when they figure that out, then it seems like they're pushing it through, but it's still a couple of weeks of discussion and announcements of here's our plan. And then what's the public response to that plan? That's a big part too, because you know we we vote for people to represent our constituency, and they're supposed to do with what's right for us. But you know, there's so many different groups of people, so many you know different incomes, and how do you make it right for everybody? Like, where you and I are both lucky, we haven't been laid off. We're able to work from 
work from home as you as people can probably see if they're watching this. <laughs> yeah. Um so I mean we're lucky that way but you know a lot of people they're not. They're not as lucky. Restaurant industry's been hit really hard for example. Oh yeah. So That's have there do you know of any changes that have happened to EI in regards to this? Um I think that as far as I'm concerned I haven't actually heard anything and again like through my work I'm getting updates nearly every day here's what the government is talking about here's what they're pushing through i haven't heard any actual changes but they're okay. gonna obviously expect an increase in um applicants towards the ei and i think there is the end goal of okay we have to allow more people to come in and percentage of wages because i believe it's only 50 55 percent of your wages are covered by ei originally but now it might be a higher percentage and then also they might in like widen or broaden the horizons of who can apply for EI. For example, mm -hmm. there's okay. uh, self-employed people. Typically, they have the option to contribute to EI if they would like, but normally they don't because why incur the extra expense? <laughs> right? It just makes sense. Everyone's then, job. No one's ever going to get fired. They're always going to always yeah. have work. <laughs> well, if you're self-employed, you don't really expect a yeah, pandemic. Exactly. To, right? Like that's kind of down long down the list of <laughs> contingencies you need to account for. But now, okay, I didn't contribute to my EI. So do I need to, can I still get on EI even if I didn't contribute? Are they going to widen the horizon that much? And maybe they won't. And that's what this emergency response benefit should hopefully account for. I guess that's a good point too, is, you know, if you can't and you haven't paid into EI, which like you said, a lot of people don't, um, which is totally fair. And I mean, even people who are working in a job opt out of it. Like a lot of employers allow people to opt out. Um, and so, you know, those people are probably going to be struggling and maybe that's what the benefit is supposed to be for. It's, it sucks that so much is up in the air right now, but um, I guess probably bringing it back more to you, tax season has been pushed back. <laughs> How has yeah. that affected you guys? <laughs> it's actually, I mean, I don't hate it. It's pretty nice. Uh, normally it's 60, maybe even 70 hour work weeks of just pushing through T1 after T1 and, and maybe some audits on top of it and just hitting all those deadlines can be pretty tough. Now the benefit is the summer you get off and it's nice, but now tax deadline got pushed. Now it's June, I believe, as well as payment deadline got pushed to September. And I think that's more to just help out everyone. Again, tough times. If you don't have the money to, because you're not getting your wages, how are you going to pay any personal tax you owe? Yeah. So again, for me, not the worst thing. Might be a longer uh, summer of doing a lot of T1s now because it got yeah pushed to June 1st is the tax filing deadline and then you don't have to pay until September 1st. And now I also saw kind of relating to, to employees and everything like that, um, the, the wage subsidy for employers. And I know that they, to apply for it, they have to have seen a decrease in 30% of their business. So obviously if you haven't gone down less than that, you can't help. I can see that being quite helpful to a lot of employers. Um, but at the same time, I'm afraid of it because if the government's paying 75% of someone's salary who is just sitting at a desk, like what is the point of that as well? So a company's paying 25% of an income and they're not doing any work. Yeah, there's no work to be done in a lot of yeah. businesses because everything's shut down. There's just, yeah, the economy slowed down so much. Um, I'm glad you brought up the wage subsidy program. The last that I heard, which was yesterday would have been April 6th was that program hasn't even been pushed through parliament yet oh, and wow, okay. a wage subsidy to that percentage is technically illegal that's the last that I heard so it's going to go through parliament to they're going to have to change legislation in order to push that through so they're going to have to change a law to be able to implement a subsidy yeah. that's what? the last illegal, I hey I to my knowledge the uh, wage subsidy I think it's the the percentage because it's that high of a percentage. Wow. And I know yeah. what they were trying to do is they were trying to mo model that after, I think it was Denmark or, or a, a country in Scandinavia, I believe it was implemented a huge wage subsidy, which is awesome. But I didn't even realize that that would be illegal. That's, That's the first I'd ever heard of it till uh, yesterday. It was people from our tax group. I want to say brought that up saying, Hey, this tech, like this hasn't been passed through because obviously we have clients coming constantly who run small businesses with a few employees and businesses decreased, but they don't want to lay off their employees. 
Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they can't afford to pay the full salaries. Well, so, yeah, and if you have no income coming in, one of the big, I, I don't know if many people know this, but some of the largest expenses for companies is going to be salaries. Like, oh, especially yeah. for small businesses. Like if you just look at like a little mom and pop shop, like, and they have, you know, 10 part-time employees, like that's a huge part of your expenses. That's typically the largest expense you'll see on small businesses ranging like five to 20 employees. I would say salaries and wages is typically the highest outside of any like materials or any direct costs you would incur. Yeah. It's all right. And then, so yeah, but like, again, it's a small community thing. You don't want to lay off those people, especially in a small business. Typically, you know them pretty well. They're friends of yours or however you know them, but you don't want to lay them off because you don't want to put them in a hard time. But at the same time, you're in a tough spot. It's it's such a weird situation because no one ever thinks of the employer. Like in a lot of these cases, like obviously the government is doing their best to try and help out both the employees and the employer. But people think, well, why can't they just pay me? You know, right. It's like, right. well, they and, don't have the money. I mean, you see the big corporations right now constantly asking for bailouts. Yeah. Like Virgin Airlines asked for bailouts, like Boeing. It's like if they're struggling to make it, how long has it been? Not even a month? Yeah. How do the small businesses, which typically make it go month to month, maybe can hold out for two. But how do you expect them to go any further if the large corporations are struggling to do that? When I saw a, kind of a, I'll say funny, quote unquote, argument um you know these big companies asking for bailouts how can they do that why is that fair and the person argued well why didn't that big company just save for something like this and keep it in their bank account and for their fair weather and it was basically the argument as to why everybody doesn't have a savings account because right. large companies have large expenses as well it's not like the bigger you get the less your expense goes even walmart like they're you know one of the largest companies in the world and they're you know they run a tight ship like yeah their costs are really low and they're saving you a lot of money but there's some products that for sure their margins are very very thin yeah and that i mean walmart is a better example they're going to be okay in the grand scheme of things because they can at least provide a lot of their services online you can do online shopping they're going to be labeled as essential if i'm sure they are already so they're going to still have a lot of sales going through so they should be fine but then one step further is their supply chain they do actually work with a lot of uh small time businesses and like wholesalers to get their um supplies and if the wholesalers are now having issues like that could be where they start to struggle the, well, their supplies had, immediately increase we had that big jump of everyone buying toilet paper and paper yeah. towel and all of that stuff. Like it was, it was crazy here. And, you know, I've heard from people all over both Canada and the U S saying the same thing, like products out. And it's not like they have a magic fairy where that product just exists now, you know, like no. everyone's shut down, whether you're, you know, a large manufacturing company or a small, you know, clothing store in, in the middle of nowhere, like everyone's getting shut down. So if you buy out an entire grocery store, it could be weeks before they're getting refilled. Right. It's not even that you're purchasing more than normal. Like the demand is higher than normal now because they're expecting to not be able to purchase it for weeks. But now it's the supply, the warehouse might be shut down. The manufacturing plant might be shut down because they don't want that many people in close contact. Or where are these products coming from? Are they coming from China, India? Um, Mexico or even the US, then even just getting the product, if it's still being produced, can take time to get over the border. It might have to go into a two week quarantine. Just you can still get the supplies, but your supplies might be delayed by a couple weeks. Yeah, it's it's insane how much it's affected our world. And it it, it blows my mind how quickly it went from this isn't our problem, it's you know, it's in China to wow, this is the entire world's problem. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Like this, it jumped everything. Like it completely yeah. jumped everything. Like, you know, I work for an online college. You work for an accounting firm. You would think we would have very little in common, but we're both working from home right now because of this whole thing. We both struggle to go to the grocery store. And, you know, I would often buy, 
you know, my shopping style is like once a month. I hate going to the grocery yeah. store personally. So when I go to Costco, you know, I buy a lot of stuff, but right now I'm really limited. So I'm having to go once a week kind of thing. And it's a total change of everything I thought I had. Oh, not even that. We're Canada was, a, I want to say a bit further ahead than other countries in terms of shutting everything down early. And then we're in BC, a more spread out province than look at Ontario or anything like that. So again, like we're further ahead, we're in better shape than other provinces and other countries. And yet still like our lives are way like affected way more than I ever expected. And I can deal with it. It's not that big of an issue on my end, but overall it's been, it's just a complete change in our lifestyle. It blew my mind. And I, I mean, I like, let me get your thoughts. How do you like working from home actually? Uh, I don't hate it. It's weird though. It's yeah. a change. It's hard to separate the work and the home, right? My computer's 10 feet away from me at all times. It's, oh, should I be working? Should I just check this email, see what I have? Because I know I'll have um, other employees, uh, managers, partners, whoever emailing me about things to look at at 7 PM. And that's just the common practice. People work whatever hours they work, but now it's, okay, when am I actually supposed to be available? When should I not be available? And should I, making sure I have that divide between taking the night off and relaxing and also working, right? I can't be in work mode all day. That's one of the biggest things that I don't know if people know about working from home is that work-life balance. It sometimes is so hard to disappear. And if you don't have like a separate room like that you can make your office, it gets even harder. So for me, like when I was back in the office, you know, I would work in the office all day and I'd come home and casually work on my laptop, send some emails, look at some documents and stuff like that. But now that I'm working full time at home, like my laptop that I used to casually work on is now what I work on 24 seven, basically. And, you know, it's the same laptop that I'll look up recipes on when I'm making dinner. So it's so easy for me when I'm, you know, making dinner to look at my email and go, oh, I can rec reply to this, you know, when, you know, we have some clients in Australia, for example. And so dealing with them, you know, sometimes really convenient to be up at nine o'clock at night sending emails when I really should be sitting down and watching TV. Yeah, just taking some time for yourself and relaxing. It seems almost like my original thought would be the opposite is that, oh, I won't be as focused on work, but almost it's more of a focus on work. Your mind's there all the time because it's so close to you. There's no getting away from it. And I think, yeah, people, people that I work with have their laptops and whole setup on their kitchen table. And it's just, even that it's like, it's too close. The proximity is just, it's too much to handle almost. And it happens so quickly too. Like it, we seriously went from everything's okay to everyone needs to be working from home and laid off. Like in the matter of what, a couple of weeks, maybe? Oh, it was days at my office. It was Monday. To, I was fine. Didn't expect anything different. I knew some people would be, um, some other offices would be slowing down and closing if it's higher risk. But at that point, there was nothing even in BC. And then by Wednesday night, it was like, that's your last day at the office. You got to work from home. So it was like two days that really I'd noticed. And it was just on the Wednesday where it was like, okay, grab everything I need. We're all working from home now. That's crazy. It, it blew my mind that how how fast this was. Now, I want to talk, we've been kind of talking about working from home. I want to talk about contracting from home. Um, people, you know, we've, we've been talking about starting your own business, um, self-employed people, all that, who work from home, I mean, as their job. And there's so many different questions that people have about that. For example, one of the biggest questions we get is what can I write off? Right. So the really simple answer is whatever is actually pertains to your business, whatever expenses you've incurred is what you should write off. Now with tax, to me, it's always, that's easier said than done, right? Like tax follows law, not any type of accounting standard, which is, I always find more clear than any law laws. These laws seem to be based on precedent. And so, okay, typically CRA allows this, or it went to an actual court and CRA was ruled against and the judge, now we know this is allowed. But there's so many small areas that haven't really been tested yet in court. So it's okay, yeah, this looks like this is what normally is allowed. Um, you'll see many people, right? So a simple business 
either as a corporation or if you're self-employed, the expenses should be the same. Any supplies, any like advertising expenses, salaries and wages, office expenses, insurance, anything like that, simple write-off shouldn't be an issue. Um, where you get into more questionable gray area is home expenses or business use of home expenses. Now that's an easier one. If you can prorate it based off your household, you will have like, for instance, I work in a home office. I know the square footage of it is say whatever, 20 square feet out of a hundred or 200 square foot home. So 10% is related to my business use of home expenses. And from there, I just total up my expenses for the year, mortgage interest, property taxes, house insurance, utilities. So you can even do it utilities then too. So yeah, you your like, house utilities. Oh, okay. So like water, electricity, what about internet and internet, Wi-Fi? Internet okay. also counts. And then there's, see, that's one debate I think I've seen had is, I can't do my business without internet. Is it, can I fully write it off or is it a house expense because it's a home internet, but I can't do, it's not like I'm using 10% of the internet for business. It's either I'm probably I, using I the have it or I, honestly. Well, it's a, either I have it or I don't. Okay. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay 10% of the internet costs for my business. So maybe there's the eligibility to deduct it fully. And I've never seen what the correct use is, but typically I would, push that for fully deduct, but there's the argument either way that you can only deduct 10% or whatever your business of your home is, the percentage, okay. right? So again, going back to utilities, it's a bit more obvious if you have a lighting, something like that would account for 10% of your home. So you get to deduct 10% of your lighting costs or your utility costs. That makes sense. What mm -hmm. about something like, um, let's say you hired a a you had a cleaner come in and clean your house twice a month. That's, that's a great one. Um, I could see the argument going both ways again, right? I would say you can probably deduct that at a 10% rate or at a, a prorated amount based off what your business is. Because if you owned a normal business, you would probably have janitors, custodial staff, anything like that cleaning up. So I would imagine it's kind of the same. Now, what? so what, do you know what the process is for if you, let's say you wrote off full, um, your full internet and the government come back and, and says, I don't know if you can do that. Do you know what that sort of process looks like afterwards? Yeah. So again, I haven't seen it for internet. I imagine it could show up, but. Or I guess you, here, you why don't you give a more relevant example? Well, yeah, I, I, <laughs> no, no, no. I like it as an example. So I'll, cause it's a simple one. So it, I like it. Um, what it would normally show up in is just a reassessment of your taxes. It's, Hey, this is what you claimed as an expense. We prorated it by 10%. Instead of putting it as a hundred percent expense, it's only a 10% of it. You can count. We pushed it down to your business use of home expense. This is your new um, taxable income. Here's your new taxes owing. And like, this is what you paid. This is the difference. If you want to debate it, if you want to argue it, you can. But typically you get a letter showing here, we reassessed your taxes. Here's the new amount you owe. And I guess the only reason to try and argue would be if it's kind of a, a big amount. I mean, prorating your mm -hmm. internet over the year really wouldn't save you a, a, a no. crazy amount in comparison to other things. So one thing I think a lot of people have questions about is your car and gas yeah. and insurance. Um, with, That's what I see a lot. Of so it's a good one to bring up because over the last couple of years, it's something CRA has cracked down on. I think vehicle expenses for personal use or like the expenses reported on your T1 is probably the biggest um, reassessment that I've seen. So like in terms of volume, like this is what they're cracking down on. We'll help out clients when they get those letters saying, hey, please provide support for these expenses. So typically you can put in, here's the amount of car expenses I incurred in a year and just file that away with your taxes and gets deducted automatically. But now CRA will flag a number of them. They're large or unusual or randomly comes back to you. Hey, you have to provide support for these expenses. So, so I've, it heard, is a good one. I've heard one of the best ways to kind of work with that. And it seems insane to me that you keep a logbook of every time you drive. Yeah, 
that's you know, I, I don't wired under CRA to keep a really so you it, yeah wow so even like you're saying like does it have to be like super specific like I left the house at 8 a.m. I got no. in at nine and no, I drove no. it's just kilometer based it would be or miles I guess a uh, place like where you started where you finished how many kilometers in between so if you wanted to go you drove from your house to your client's house and then you went from your clients to the grocery store and home you might mm-hmm. run into some issues there. If you're claiming the full kilometers, yeah. It's okay. Again, it's for business purposes. Um, a chiropractor who does home visits is a good example, right? Like he'll go to clients places specifically to help them, right? This is a business expense now is using your car. So you can tally up all your uh, expenses, your car expenses for the year. And again, prorate them based off your business kilometers and then CRA will come back if you get flagged and say what's probably what's your large 10 largest invoices for the year give us a list of all of your expenses that got to that number and then your mileage log is typically what they would ask for something in that ballpark okay so that's kind of the so if you are putting it down you have to make sure you have all your gas receipts insurance any repairs and maintenance because again all that you can claim and you can prorate it but if they come back and you don't have any of the receipts. If you don't have that mileage log, then it's all going to get wiped away anyways. I had an old boss who used to keep every single receipt he ever got ever for tax reasons. Like even every time he went out to get lunch, like he would keep that receipt and he was like, I can use it for my taxes. And I was like, I don't know how you can use your McDonald's receipt for your taxes today, but all right, man. (laughs) Yeah, that's, I mean, Depending on what you're doing, maybe if it's a business lunch, I'd take a business lunch at McDonald's. I'd take a lunch. <laughs> but then there you go. There is a write-off, but then it'll come back, right? Yeah, you have to have seven years. Seven years is what you got to keep before. Okay, so what, I guess talking about business lunches, how does that work? Do you just keep the receipt, and and do you what kind of proof do you have to have that you actually met with someone? There's a little seemingly like a gray area there. Yeah, that's. I mean. I've seen questionable receipts. I've seen liquor store receipts that are like just a six pack of beer. And you're like, "Ah, I can't imagine that's a business expense. But again, if it's in a legitimate (laughs) business expense, retain that receipt. There's only, I I've never seen CRA reject any meals and entertainment type of receipts, unless it's blatantly obvious that this isn't, this isn't business related, but yeah, business lunch, you can typically just uh, expense that. Wow. Okay. What about, what about something like a TV? I, again, I think we'd go under the same thought process if it truly is for business purposes. So, I mean, depending on your business, it might be blatantly obvious you don't need a TV, right? <laughs> fair. So if you fair. have one and yeah, then again, I think, I think the general rule applies here is if it is for business purposes, then there's no, problem claiming it and you should be able to argue that it's a it's almost like a huge gray area that the government just almost puts the trust in the person because (laughs) you know i used the tv a couple times this year to do presentations to potential new clients like good enough but 99 percent of the time the tv is used at someone's house for watching netflix or (laughs) whatever it might be so that's an interesting that's an interesting gray area that i mean i I don't think there's a way to fix it no, that's kind of what it is, right? And there's so many people that are going to try to expense whatever they can and get away with. And I think CRA is cracking down on the highest areas of risk and fraud, and they'll reassess accordingly. So if one person puts through a TV, they're probably not going to catch it. I don't know if that depends on the size and the volume. And I am imagine there's a type of analytical procedure done that says this is what they expensed last year in their business as to what they expensed this year in their business why is there a big fluctuation especially if your revenue hasn't changed where would that expense come from why has that been incurred do you know how their process works on that end like are they that thorough or is a lot more automated than we think i think it's a lot more automated than we think i think it'll there are some that are flagged based off just large amounts there are some that are flags based off significant changes from the prior year, or prior two years. And then there are some that are generally selected randomly. Like I, as far as I'm concerned, that's probably how they do it. Hmm. And then, and then it probably goes to a person afterwards to kind of assess what, 
what should be done. So I, I guess your odds of getting caught of expensing a business lunch that was to not get in trouble questionable yeah. <laughs> I mean, is very yeah. low. Yeah. So think of it too, though. Like, what's your business lunch? $40. And then what's your actual taxable income rate? Maybe 20% tops. I don't know, depending on how well your business is doing. So it's not like you're saving that much in tax by pushing in one more receipt. That's true. And that's not, and every year they seem to focus on a different area. So two years ago, they were focusing heavily on professional fees incurred. So it's legal fees, accounting fees in, um, in a self-employed business because they thought, Hey, this is, seems like an area where we're not really cracking down, but people can probably slide things through that aren't exactly a business expense. How would that work? So something that's like an accounting fee or, or a legal fee, how, do, how does someone push that through their business without it actually being a real thing? Not necessarily a fabricated thing, but maybe person, any personal type expenses would just be pushed in there and Hey, that doesn't belong. Oh, that so they're put the, you know, they go to, they get an accountant to do their personal taxes and they push that through the business. Well, now, if you are self-employed and you're putting in a business schedule in your T1, and they're providing you with tax advice and T1 prep, you can put that expense for oh. in too. Supposedly like, so much. <laughs> <laughs> and normal on your normal T1, like myself, who doesn't have a business, I just work a normal job and get a T4. I can't, I wouldn't be able to expense any fees I paid for my T1 prep. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. General tax advice is allowed. Any investment advice is allowed. Investment management fees are allowed, but actual just tax like T1 prep is not. That makes sense. Now, do you have your top accountant tips, um, tricks for both, I would say, contractors, employees, business owners? Um, is there something that you wish more people knew? <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, see, okay. Well, let me ask you as a new home buyer, how aware are you are the home buyer plan? I'm wondering if you use that. I knew about it. Um, I actually used uh, a friend of ours who was the real estate agent and he was pretty open and honest. And we were really trying to, we really looked for a house that was under $500,000 to get yeah. the new home Dude. buyers grant. And in the scheme of things, I think we saved eight thousand dollars and on a five hundred thousand dollars house that doesn't seem like a lot but i mean when everything you're count. everything counts yeah so but i mean a year ago if you asked me that question no i had no idea right yeah so you can take out 35 grand from your rsps put it towards buying a new house then that's another thing i didn't know about until recently actually and that i did end up doing that but yeah. i didn't know about that so that's right. That's my plan right now. Trying to contribute to my RSPs, hopefully buy a house. And then I have that money. I can take it out of my RSPs without being, without it being included on my T1 as income. So it's still tax free when I contribute it. And when I pull it out, it's still tax free. Now I have a question for you and I, yeah. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this because it seems it's very specific. You have <laughs> to pay it back in 15 years. That's yeah. one of the rules with doing that. Yeah. How does it work on your taxes if you do that? Uh, it's a separate form on your tax return. So you pay one fifteenth of it every year for 15 years. So if you, um, when you originally set it up as a withdrawal from your RRSPs, you will be pulling out whatever amount you pull up up to 35 grand. Then it should on your carry for, like while you're carrying forward to your next year, RRSPs will say, this is how much you owe on that plan. So how you do that is just you contribute back to your RSP. When you do that contribution, you say, okay. hey, this relates to the home buyer's plan. Gotcha. And then you reduce your amount owing in the year. Anything you don't repay in that year will then be included on, on his income. So and if you, you took out $15,000 just for easy mm -hmm. math, one fifteenth yeah. every year is going to be a thousand bucks. Yeah. So now you got, you can contribute a thousand dollars back to your RSP. You need to each year contribute a thousand dollars back to your RSP. For the that next 15 years. Yeah. Okay. And then, so that makes sense. Okay. Wow. I've just solved how to complete my taxes. That was the last thing I needed to do. <laughs> Very selfish of me to ask this question. No. And then what about uh, TFSAs? I was wondering if you're using that or think about I, that at all. Yeah, I use that. I use a 
financial advisor to do all that sort of stuff for me, I have very little idea of how it works. Like I, I why don't you explain it? I, I have a basic understanding. You definitely have a bigger understanding than I do. <laughs> well, no, that's good that you use a financial advisor. And I think the main trick to it is what you're kind of alluding to because you do have an amount that you can contribute each year in cash, which is great. And then you're not taxed on that when you withdraw it. Um, but you can also put in stocks, securities, investments in there up to the limit. And then when it's accruing income or if you're receiving dividends off these stocks or interest income off these stocks, which you would typically earn more income than just a normal savings bank account or anything like that, that you're also not taxed on. Okay. So, so you're, you're basically earn. getting, you put, you put post task tax income in that, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Cause in RSP, you take it off of your income at the end of the year on tax season, right? Like if yeah. you put in $5,000, you tech and you earn $50,000, you, the government sees you as earning $45,000. Right. Yeah. In a simple, exactly. So then this it's, you're not taxed on it until you're pulling that money out of your TFSA. Okay. And so that's why it's the retirement saving plan essentially. Right. So it's, you know, when you have no income, now you're pulling that money out and now you're seeing it as yeah. a lesser income than if you would have. Because if you start taking your RRSPs out, let's just say you're earning $100,000, again, for easy math, and you pull out 50 grand a year out of your RRSPs, the government taxes you at 150 rather than 100. Exactly. So then, yeah. If you're getting so then, 100 grand, you're still pulling out of your RRSPs. <laughs> you yeah. may have made the wrong choice. But yeah, no, you got the right, you got the right idea. And now and the then, TFSA is your, it's your post-tax money. So it doesn't come off your income. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to clarify though, is on the investments within there is day trading could be lucrative, but if CRA assesses that you're day trading within your TFSA, then it's taxable. And what would that be defined as? Well, to my knowledge, it's a gray area, right? But okay. day trading is if you're going to have significant, if you have daily transactions or probably even weekly transactions of buying and selling stock in order to incur high capital gains, but you don't want to be taxed on those capital gains. That's what I would imagine the definition of day trading is or how they see it. Now, what's capital gains? Uh, whatever you bought the stock for compared to what you sold it for. I'm assuming it'll be hopefully you're selling it for an increased value. The difference is your capital gain. Typically you're taxed on that because you made money selling a stock, a stock or any type of investment. And now but, does that, is there a certain rate that that's taxed at? Yeah, it will be taxed at the investment tax rate, which would depend where your taxable income lies at. Okay. But you can be, ta you'll be taxed at a higher rate. So the more but money you're earning personally, affects right. how much you're so let's do a big example here because i know there's capital gains tax on selling houses so say on the side you're flipping houses right and you're making you know a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on that is your rate just going to skyrocket then because you're earning so much more not necessarily i mean okay you said flipping houses so that would likely be business income and then it will be taxed differently just put in just uh, to oh. clarify Okay. Right. If that's your business, then that's your normal employment income. But if you're working, say, full time as as an employee somewhere, and then you started selling houses that's on the side, question. it it's different from investment income. But I see what you're going for. Okay. Uh, I I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Rocket, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, invest like you would push that as a business income, I would imagine. But um, yeah, investment income will be just taxed at a higher rate depending on your taxable income. Interesting. Okay. So I, I didn't even know that there was, I didn't know that would be three different tax rates. Yeah. The, well, yeah. I mean, tax rates just jump up based off your personal income, right? Mm -hmm. Like you'll go into, depending what bracket you're in. And now, so that does that then affect your capital gains if you're doing day trading in your TFSA? Well, yeah, if you're doing day trading in your TFSA, CRA will assess any capital gains as fully taxable. So okay. instead of like initially where you just have investments in there, not doing anything or every once in a while buying and selling investments, 
that's fine. And any capital gains won't be assessed until you withdraw them from your TFSA. But if you're doing it every day, they're going to look at all of your gains and all your losses and tax you that way. And typically if you're day trading, you're doing it because you're making money off it. That makes sense. So, so that just CRA has been cracking down on that a bit too. So it's good to have a financial advisor sometimes take a look at it. So it doesn't, uh, well, unless they're doing tra day trading for you, but well, they should know what they're doing. I would know <laughs> yeah. that, right? Like they know, they know what they're up to. That's for sure. Is there anything else that you think stands out for maybe a subcontractor or a contractor who's working from home that, you know, you would think they probably should know, even if it seems obvious. That's we, we, we had a conversation before, before we started this about something that seems obvious, but until you think about that thing, it's irrelevant. Oh, okay. Well, this is going to be, this does, I guess. Yeah, you're right. Are they a contractor or are they an employee is a big, very common tax issue you will see. So there's a list of six rules or uh, criteria that kind of determine if they're an employee or a contractor, and then they're treated differently for tax purposes, depending which one they are. So a big one is if they're working for a company as a contractor, does the company know they're a contractor or are they treating them as an employee? Because that'll affect, right? You need to be on the same page. And how is the work being performed? What's the manner? Who is making these decisions on the scheduling and the employees? Who owns the tools? It'll be a list of criteria. But if you think you're a contractor, but your employer hasn't had that conversation with you, then that could be an issue coming up for tax time. So what happens if you're, you know, you you're a contractor and it's sort of leaning towards being an employee, like they're crossing some of their, those boundaries? What happens there? Because I bet you there, I'm guessing here, there's a ton of gray area there, as to what can be what. Uh, yeah, for sure. So typically, like someone like me would look at it and look at all the facts and say, okay, you're probably a contractor, or hey, you're probably an employee. This is how it's going to go. Like, this is how you need to report your business or report your income. So if they're an employee, they'll get the T4 at the end of the year. If they're a contractor, it might be a little different on how they're getting their income. They might need to self-report it. And then if they're just self-employed, they may not need to contribute to EI, which is a big benefit for contractors. They might not want to incur that additional expense. This is how you do a full circle. We started yeah. by talking about EI and we're ending by talking about EI. That, I would love to say I planned it that way. That is top quality content. I don't want to take you to take you for too long here, Max. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, it was awesome having you. I mean, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> that, that's for sure. Um, again, thanks for coming. Max Eisner. Thanks for having me.